Give me an example, I said quietly, of something that means something, in your opinion. Wuthering Heights, she said, without hesitation. But that's unreasonable, you're talking about a work of genius. It was, wasn't it? My wild, sweet Kathy. God, I cried buckets. I saw it ten times. I said, oh, with recognizable relief. Oh, with a shameful rising inflection. The movie. Most of us have probably felt something like this before, right? That there's some disconnect between a book and its film adaptation. Or maybe you've heard that infamous phrase, the book was better. How ironic that this sentiment appears in Breakfast at Tiffany's, a novella that became a film notoriously disliked by its author, Truman Capote, and drastically changed from its original version. As it turns out, people have very strong opinions about Breakfast at Tiffany's. There's the usual dorm room decor type fandom you probably recognize, but there are also people who cannot stand it, and as we'll see, for justifiable reasons. When I asked people to tell me on Instagram about why they don't like it, the most common responses came down to personal taste, it's boring, and the way the film is treated culturally, its fans are annoying. But many of the most common responses, I think, can be attributed to the way it was adapted from novella to film. Things were changed, left out, it was miscast. So in this video, I'll break down some of the differences between the book and the movie, why certain changes were made during the adaptation process, and how those changes both affect Capote's intentions and explain some of the perceived shortcomings of the film. Before we get started, I'm very happy to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Mubi, a curated streaming service that shows exceptional films from around the globe. Every day, Mubi presents a new film, each one thoughtfully handpicked by their team of curators. With this service, it's incredibly easy to discover countless gems anytime, anywhere, so I highly recommend that you give it a try. Click the link in the description below to try it for yourself and get a whole month free at mubi.com slash bekindrewind. Truman Capote's 1958 novella, Breakfast at Tiffany's, is told primarily in flashback. An unnamed narrator, a gay writer living in New York City, receives word that his friend, the infamous Holly Golightly, may have been spotted traveling in Africa. The news is a bit surprising. He hasn't seen Holly in years, not since they lived in the same apartment building during World War II. After he learns her most recent whereabouts, the narrator spends the remainder of the book, which is only about 85 pages long total, reminiscing about Holly, what they did together, what he knows about her, and why she fascinates him. We learn a lot of details you probably recall from the film. She grew up in Tulip, Texas. She was married at 14 to a much older man. She ran away and has since been fending for herself in the big city, scheming for a better future with her brother, Fred, who's off at war. Capote's precise, witty language felt electric on the page, and studios, well aware of how his recent work had been selling, showed interest in purchasing the film rights. Martin Juro and Richard Shepard, producers at Paramount who had produced Tennessee Williams' The Fugitive Kind, approached Capote with an offer. It took a fair amount of coaxing, but eventually he agreed, and Paramount began developing the film version of Breakfast at Tiffany's. The challenge for the studio became obvious quite quickly. Although it may not be readily apparent from the quick summary I just did, Breakfast at Tiffany's, as written by Truman Capote, was not exactly adaptation friendly, especially in 1960, both for its plotlessness and its content, which we'll get into in a minute. This became glaringly apparent when they received their first draft of the screenplay written by Sumner Locke Elliott. Elliott was primarily a television writer, but Juro and Shepard believed that because he lived in New York, maybe Elliott could accurately translate the modern, edgy feel of the novella for the screen. In his book about the making of Breakfast at Tiffany's, Fifth Avenue, 5 a.m., Sam Wasson includes an internal memo from Shepard to a Paramount studio chief that reveals the producer's reaction to Elliott's first draft. Suffice it to say, we are all immensely disappointed in Elliot's efforts. Disregarding its length and peculiar physical format, we are most disturbed by its episodic, disjointed, fluffy, and even ephemeral tone. The young man he has written is petty and unattractive in character, borders on the effeminate, which we all detest. Most important, however, a dramatically sound storyline and point of view is either non-existent or certainly not clear. 
All of us are convinced that we are correct in assuming that the boy and the girl end up together at the end of our story. That's Holly's problem, which is the principal one, is in some way resolved through the understanding, love, and strength of the boy. Episodic and ephemeral, a non-existent plot, no romance between the leads, I mean, based on Shepard's description, it sounds like Elliot delivered a screenplay that faithfully reflected the nature of the book. And yet Shepard was immensely disappointed. The memo makes it very clear. The movie the producers wanted to make had little to do with the book they actually bought, either because A, they never actually understood the book in the first place, I mean, what? Or B, they had an intuitive sense that many of the elements that make the book so enchanting were not necessarily appropriate for commercial film projects in 1960. So for Paramount, the next move was obvious. Elliot had to be replaced. The next screenwriter would have explicit instructions to reconfigure Breakfast at Tiffany's into a romantic comedy in which Holly and the unnamed narrator end up together. Enter George Axelrod. In 1952, he wrote an enormously successful play called The Seven Year Itch, which in 1955 he adapted with Billy Wilder into an enormously successful film. His experience translating The Seven Year Itch gave the producers confidence in two important ways. First, it demonstrated that Axelrod could make structural changes to the source material that could suit a different medium. For example, in taking his story from the stage to the screen, he added and dropped various characters, as well as storytelling devices like using inner voices. Second, it meant Axelrod had already learned how to tone down a sexually charged text to appease the censors. This ranged from editing lines or jokes to big changes like reducing a sexual encounter between the leads in the play to just a kiss in the film. In 1960, films were still subject to rigorous censorship in which things like sex and violence were heavily regulated. So even if Paramount planned to take certain liberties with Capote's work, the adaptation would still require a seasoned professional to see the project through the approval process. So with all of this experience and with his directive from the producers, Axelrod took the skeleton of Capote's novella and gave it the structure we know today. The rom-com Paramount apparently wanted, but definitely didn't buy. To achieve this new narrative, he came up with a couple of key changes. Change one, Paul Varjak. The formerly unnamed narrator, sometimes called Fred, gained a real name for the film version. He also gained an entirely new occupation. In addition to being a writer, Paul moonlights as a sex worker under the employment of Change 2, 2E, a new character played by Patricia Neal. She's a rich, older woman, presumably stuck in an unhappy marriage, who secretly pays for Paul's apartment and lifestyle in exchange for sex. Axelrod added this character to help shape both Paul and Holly's connection, and the film's general conflict. Paul must relinquish his relationship with Neil's character before he feels he can seriously pursue Holly. Holly must stop chasing the richest men in Brazil so she can finally be loved. Of course, these relationships also mean that Paul is no longer gay, which leads us to change three, the straightness of it all. Queerness runs throughout the original book. Holly's dialogue frequently alludes to either her own queerness or her acceptance of queer life. In the book, Holly also suggests that Rusty Trawler isn't just a rich single man, but a closeted rich single man. And of course, there's the narrator. And while it's never explicitly stated that he's gay, it's coded through contemporary jargon and through the nature of their relationship. In the book, the narrator isn't in love with Holly so much as he is fascinated by or preoccupied with her. As Rebecca Renner wrote in the Paris Review, Paul and Holly are bound to each other precisely because their intimacy is platonic and therefore not transactional. Unlike the rest of their relationships in their lives, Paul and Holly don't need each other for money or sex. Instead, when they are together, it's a choice made for the pure pleasure of each other's company. All of this was erased both in service of the romantic plotline and in anticipation of censorship. According to the Hayes Code, which is essentially the rule book studios had to follow, positive depictions or endorsements of homosexual behavior were forbidden. It's not that films weren't more openly dealing with this issue at the time. In fact, Audrey Hepburn's next movie was The Children's Hour, a film in which a student spreads a rumor about her two female teachers being romantically involved with each other. That rumor alone is ammunition enough to ruin their lives and leads to a horrifying conclusion. 1961 also saw the release of Basil Dearden's Victim, 
a film about a married, closeted gay man in Britain who is blackmailed with evidence of his affairs. Released at a time when homosexual acts were illegal in England, the film details the all too real struggle of living as a gay person during that time. Capote didn't write suffering oppressed queer characters into his novella. And because mainstream films were not inclined to portray queer people as living normal lives, perhaps even thriving ones, it's quite clear that beyond any restrictions of the code, the rom-com version of Breakfast at Tiffany's was never going to be frank about its queer origins. It was always intended to be a heterosexual fantasy that would appeal to the greatest number of ticket buyers. This change represented both the loss of the book's more subversive elements and tonal shifts in Holly's characterization, including change four, Holly's work. One of the most common questions I came across when researching this video was some version of, is Holly Golightly a sex worker? Here's how Truman Capote described her in a 1968 interview with Playboy. Holly Golightly was not precisely a call girl. She had no job, but accompanied expense account men to the best restaurants and nightclubs with the understanding that her escort was obligated to give her some sort of gift, perhaps jewelry or a check. Holly was always running to the girl's room and asking her date, may I have a little powder room change? And the man would give her $50. Usually her escort was a married man from out of town who was lonely and she would flatter him and make a good impression on his associates, but there was no emotional involvement on either side. The girl expected nothing but a present and the man nothing but some good company and ego bolstering. Although if she felt like it, she might take her escort home for the night. Consistent with this description, the book depicts her social life as her job. She flits from one social engagement to the next, one night surrounded by four unidentified men at the 21 Club, the next dancing with a group of Australian officers singing Waltzing Matilda, with the understanding that each interaction is transactional and is meant to financially sustain her. The film deliberately makes this work much more vague than in the book. It's clear that she goes out and has a good time, but for the most part, it reads like it's all for the fun of it. No direct income is mentioned beyond her weekly visit to Sally Tomato and one fleeting reference to $50 for the powder room. And even that is easy to miss. In a recent article about the fandom surrounding Breakfast at Tiffany's, one fan mentioned that when she first saw the film at 12 or 13, she never noticed the comment about the powder room. Maybe I'm naive in asking this, she said, but what does Holly mean by it? I couldn't really guess. This is actually my experience with the film too. When I was younger, I never noticed that line either. And even if I had, I don't think I would have understood it. And I imagine future generations will have the same problem, the more dated the terminology gets. In fact, it's literally the number one people also ask question on Google. So even though Holly isn't really a sex worker, she is sexual and frankly discusses her opinions about and history with sex throughout the novella. This of course also had to be edited out. So we must wave goodbye to her pregnancy and her 11 lovers. After all, Audrey Hepburn's Holly was certainly not going to say, I mean, you can't bang the guy and cash his checks and at least not try to believe you love him. Gone too are most of the references about her sexual abuse, and with that, her age raised from 19 to Audrey's 31, a much easier age to suggest sexual activity has occurred. By the way, how poorly does it speak of Hollywood that the age gap between Audrey Hepburn and Buddy Ebsen doesn't even look that out of the ordinary for this era? Like, Buddy Ebsen was four years younger than Cary Grant, who she was paired with in Charade, and seven years younger than Gary Cooper, who she was paired with in Love in the Afternoon. So these changes to Holly's relationship with sex were made both, again, to appease the censors who policed sex generally, and to soften Holly and give her a broader appeal. This approach was generally effective, as proven by another fan in the New York Times article who said, maybe she was a call girl, an escort, a cold digger, but I don't think she would do anything she felt uncomfortable with. Without the gritty details that might alienate audiences or turn her easy, whimsical lifestyle into demanding work, she feels more empowered, a feeling reinforced by change five, Holly's fate. Every rom-com needs a happy ending, so of course the film had no other option than to have Holly reunite with her lost cat and choose to stay with Paul. The book, however, takes a different route. Like in the movie, Holly releases her unnamed cat from the taxi cab. Filled with immediate regret, she gets out, searches for it, but unlike the movie, she doesn't find it. Oh Jesus God, she says, we did belong to each other. He was mine. 
I'm very scared, Buster. Yes, at last, because it could go on forever, not knowing what's yours until you've thrown it away. And despite being out on bail because of the Sally Tomato case, she takes a plane to Brazil, effectively guaranteeing she'll be running from something forever. Holly's tragedy is that she believes she's independent, when really she's just alone and has no idea what she's actually looking for. What a depressing conclusion, far too depressing for a rom-com. The film's final task then was to turn Holly from, as Capote put it, a symbol of all these girls who come to New York and spin in the sun for a moment like mayflies and then disappear into a lost girl who tidily finds her happiness in the form of true love. Now, Holly and Paul weren't the only characters who were changed for the film. Yeah, okay, we have to talk about change number six, Mr. Yuniyoshi. The yikes role of the century, a role which has rendered the film virtually and justifiably, to be honest, unwatchable for many, many people. I mean, even the people who like to rush to my comments and write something like, I don't come here for your politics. Cancel culture is ruining everything. Why can't you just talk about movies? Can you do Best Actress 1950? I think that would be an interesting race. Even they can pretty much agree that this is bad. Now, Mr. Yunoyoshi is a character in the original book. Like in the film, he's Holly's upstairs neighbor whose door she occasionally rings when she forgets her key. But that's where the similarities end. The book does not indicate any accent. He's described as being from California. Although the book does take place during World War II and the characters do refer to him with some contemporaneous racial slurs. In the film, well, he's written as a bumbling busybody and walking exaggeration. I've talked about the long history of yellowface in American cinema on this channel a few times, so I'm not gonna lay out that history here, but I'll link those videos in the description, as well as Melissa Perksashard's paper, The Many Lives of Mr. Yunioshi, which specifically outlines how this role falls in context with that history. I do, however, want to detail the absolute clusterfuck of decisions that Paramount made regarding this role, because A, the whole thing is probably worse than you thought, and B, as a way of showing this kind of racism requires a collaboration of systems, a series of decision makers who say yes, rather than simply one individual's performance. So Axelrod initially expanded Yunioshi's role in the original screenplay, but it was Blake Edwards who expanded it further for comedic purposes. Essentially, he and his former roommate, Mickey Rooney, thought this character was very funny as a stereotype and decided to play it that way. Pruxishart writes that Axelrod recounted in an interview, each time Yunioshi appeared, I said, Jesus Blake, can't you see that it fucks the movie up? Edwards said, we need comedy in this, and Mickey's character is funny. Axelrod even convinced Hepburn to reshoot some scenes for free in the hope that Yunioshi could be edited out of the film, but Edwards was adamant. Apparently, so was the marketing apparatus at Paramount. She writes, between October and December 1960, Paramount released a series of 12 press releases announcing its casting of a Japanese actor named Ohio Arigatu to play Mr. Yunioshi. Of course, there was no Ohio Arigatu, which translates into hello, thank you in Japanese. It was just Mickey Rooney the whole time. But Paramount thought it would be a funny gimmick to invent a narrative about an up-and-coming Japanese comic who had become famous entertaining the troops abroad and was finally making his debut in American films. Interviews with this fake entertainer were printed in phonetically broken English. They even went so far as to list him as a cast member in weekly trade publications. Eventually, Paramount came clean and brought the press in on the joke. As Pruxishart writes, Indeed, the entire reveal was done in a merry, backslapping fashion, in which the studio, the press, and the actor all colluded. No apologies were given, the encloaking was used instead to create even more mischief. Rooney gave a statement explaining the situation, although he did so, according to the press release, in full makeup, eyes slanting, hair jet black, teeth as prominent as a picket fence in the moonlight. Once the film was ready for distribution, Rooney's performance of Yunioshi was one of Paramount's distinct advertising features for creating buzz around the film. <sighs> so once the screenplay was in place, the question became, who's going to play Holly? Jiro and Shepard tossed around a few names, including Shirley MacLaine and Jane Fonda, but had to pause to consider the actress Truman Capote had named his ideal filmic Holly Golightly. 
Marilyn Monroe. This choice, to anyone with a passing knowledge of Marilyn Monroe's life and work, is an extremely intuitive one. Marilyn shared several biographical details with Holly that might have informed her performance, including a tumultuous upbringing, marriage when she was just a teenager, although not to a much older man, and her escape into an ostensibly more glamorous life that introduced its own forms of abuse. There's also Holly's work entertaining and attracting men. Obviously, getting $50 for the powder room isn't quite the same thing as being a movie star, but Monroe's star persona was shaped by characters whose relationship with men echoed Holly's. She's frequently fetishized, an obviously beautiful and available woman who easily attracts crowds of admirers and can use her beauty and charm to her advantage. Much like the film version of Breakfast at Tiffany's, her films tend to revolve around a male protagonist who's not merely interested in her as an observer, but is actively trying to win her over. Any number of her films could work as an example of this. Let's Make Love, Some Like It Hot, The Prince and the Showgirl, Bus Stop, The Seven Year Itch. Capote would have not only understood these more concrete parallels, but also as a friend of Marilyn's, probably witnessed parts of her personality that informed his choice. Their glamour is learned and manufactured. Marilyn Monroe is a distinct persona who evolved from Norma Jean Baker in the way that Holly Golightly was invented by Lula Mae Barnes. From young women with nothing to self-made young women who professionally negotiate their power relative to men, Holly and Marilyn demonstrated admirable street smarts and resilience. But neither woman emerged from their cocoons without battle scars. Immense vulnerabilities and insecurities chase them both. And knowing everything we know now about Marilyn, it is, for example, easy to picture her as a character who never found her cat, so to speak. Jiro and Shepard, however, wanted to go in a different direction. Someone who seemed more innocent and whimsical. Someone who didn't ooze the lusty brand of sex appeal that Marilyn Monroe had perfected. They also, frankly, had practical matters to consider. By that point, Marilyn had difficulty remembering her lines and was notoriously late and unreliable on set. Remember, we're about a year out from her death here, so this was by no means an easy time in her life. Employing her meant accepting certain risks that the producers weren't willing to take. So with their own version of Holly in mind, and again with significant coaxing, the role went to Audrey Hepburn, a decision I'd argue had the greatest impact on the film's lasting power and legacy. Remember that very scientific poll I showed you at the beginning of this video? A lot of people who said that Audrey was miscast specifically mentioned Marilyn Monroe as their preferred choice. Personally, I'm not really in either camp here. I think they both offer a lot. But there are a few reasons why Audrey Hepburn seems less suited to the role than Marilyn. First, Audrey naturally reads very chic and regal on screen. Like, she never had to learn it. Like, it's part of who she is. Of course, Audrey's childhood was far from idyllic, but in different ways. She didn't grow up in a way that would necessitate a total self-reinvention to achieve commercial success. That ballet posture and hard to place European accent make her appear so innately elegant, are so hard to mask, and are even more difficult to believe were effortlessly mastered by a teenage runaway child bride from Tulip, Texas. Second, sex appeal in the way we generally define it, and certainly in the way they defined it in the 50s and 60s, were not part of Audrey's persona. Her persona, in fact, explicitly played on the idea that one could conceivably not find her attractive. In my video about her Oscar win, I talked at length about how Audrey was perceived as a Cinderella figure. She begins films like Sabrina and Funny Face quiet and reserved, afraid of spreading her wings, wearing mousy browns and boxy outfits that hide her figure. But then something happens in the plot. She moves to Paris or is discovered by a photographer and some physical transformation occurs. She finally comes into her own and usually finds love in the process. Audrey's appeal then is much more wholesome and aspirational. She's a stand-in for the audience, still down to earth enough to feel relatable and unpretentious while enacting our fashion and beauty fantasies. In other words, the typical Audrey Hepburn character is essentially the opposite of Holly as she's written by Truman Capote. Holly knows she has sex appeal from the beginning and smartly learns how to wield it to her benefit. She's mildly self-destructive, not particularly wholesome, and couldn't be farther from hashtag relationship goals. But as we've already established, Paramount didn't exactly want Capote's Holly. They wanted Axelrod's eccentric dreamer, a breezy and sophisticated avatar for an early 60s New York fantasy. 
And Audrey gave them that. She doesn't ooze sex appeal or danger in a way that would make the controversial parts of Holly more obvious. Casting her made sense of the vagueness and sweetness written into the script. But it's also arguably the decision most responsible for the widespread misinterpretation of the character and film. Consider how the opening scene of Breakfast at Tiffany's is one of the most repeated images in pop culture today, and is almost never used in a way consistent with its function in the film. Instead of seeing a horribly depressed girl who has nothing left in her life but pure escapism, people simply see a beautiful woman with apparent access to luxury. We see Holly as an aspirational figure because, with her intricate updo and Givenchy gown, she looks like she belongs at Tiffany's. That sense or feeling is fundamentally a consequence of casting Audrey Hepburn. As much as Paramount was interested in making Holly more like Audrey, the studio still acknowledged that Holly was quite different from Audrey's normal fare. There would be no physical Cinderella-esque transformation, and although the film would never outright depict risque behaviors, it would certainly suggest some that weren't common in her filmography. And with that in mind, Paramount marketed Audrey's performance as playing against type. By playing a quote-unquote bad girl, she was seen as taking her career in a more serious direction. She often spoke about Breakfast at Tiffany's and the Children's Hour in tandem as evidence of this pivot. Audrey, though, was careful to distinguish herself from Holly and assured the press that she and Holly were nothing alike in real life. What sort of a girl is she? She's a, what they call in America these days, a kook. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Spelled with a, a K, I believe. <laughs> which is a dizzy, gay type of girl. Anything like you? I'm not quite that way, no. <laughs> I mention this because, one, Audrey did feel genuinely challenged by this role. As an extremely introverted person, accustomed to playing a particular type, portraying Audrey made her very nervous, and she was very clear about this from the beginning with the producers. Two, there was still a sense in the press and the wider public that even this neutered version of Holly Golightly posed some threat to society. Whether Holly was a quote-unquote moral character or not was up for debate and constantly discussed in articles about the film. I think 99% of the people who watch Breakfast at Tiffany's now will find that absolutely absurd, and rightly so. But I think that's also kind of the point and what makes this film so interesting in its original context. Watching it again for this video, I was struck by how modern Holly still felt. She feels so familiar, so similar to the countless characters that have imitated her since, to the point that I can understand why people watching this film for the first time might be underwhelmed or maybe even inclined to roll their eyes, because they've seen it so many times before. However, she only feels so modern today because she was ahead of her time then. If you look at the most popular romantic comedies in the years surrounding Breakfast at Tiffany's, Pillow Talk, Gigi, Gidget, their female leads are nothing like Holly. To be a heroine in these films meant to actively strive for marriage, to save themselves for their one true love, to avoid certain subjects altogether. They imply happiness only comes from following a specific path or ethos. A great example of what divergence from this path could mean is Elia Kazan's Splendor in the Grass, which also came out in 1961. In its simplest terms, it's a drama about the consequences of sexual repression and outlines a very specific cinematic binary. There are good girls, like Natalie Wood's character Deanie, who don't party and have sex, and there are bad girls, like Barbara Loden's character Ginny, who do and pay for it. Girls like Ginny are often portrayed as mentally unstable or unhappy and frequently end up dead as some karmic punishment for their sins. For example, both she and Elizabeth Taylor's character in Butterfield 8 meet the same fate. And that girl Ginny got killed in a car accident. Oh, we all knew something like that would happen the way she carried on. Holly sits somewhere in between, complicating this cinematic binary. Because Audrey plays her so warmly and accessibly, she doesn't seem like an uninhibited or dangerous wild child, not in the way that Ginny does. But her choices are technically much more like Ginny's than they are like Deanie's. She drinks, parties, has sex. For women who had just lived through the 1950s, Holly represented a new path forward. She was a living portrait of a single woman in New York who didn't crave marriage above all else, who didn't want to live in a cage, who managed to have a good time without seeming victimized or doomed. 
In the early years of the sexual revolution, before the release of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, she felt noticeably different, and many young women took note. She even famously inspired Gloria Steinem, who adopted Holly's signature striped hair dye as an homage. Never mind that the book version remained a lost searching soul who never really learned what love meant, the movie version did, and those are the images that stayed with them. So the question I have is, considering how enormously popular this performance became for women who felt trapped, for women who continue to crave escapism, to what extent does it actually matter that Holly was apparently miscast? Does the not insignificant cultural impact of Audrey's performance outweigh the importance of a well-cast film? I don't think that's an easy question to answer, particularly when the alternatives are purely hypothetical. One story of note here. Paramount almost didn't buy the rights to Breakfast at Tiffany's because they thought the book and its characters might be too similar to Goodbye to Berlin, the novel by Christopher Isherwood that eventually became the musical and movie Cabaret. This is interesting because when it came to casting, Jiro and Shepard essentially made the same quote unquote mistake that Bob Fosse would make when casting Sally Bowles 10 years later. The character is written and performed on stage as a very obviously amateur performer who aspires to, but more than likely will never achieve greatness. But that's the problem, right? Her delusion doesn't really work in the film because she's played by Liza Minnelli, an extremely capable and charismatic performer. It's not difficult to imagine a woman with those gifts succeeding. And yet, who cares? I mean, obviously some people care and some people don't like it, but also, okay. I mean, good for those people, but her performance is so iconic in its own right, so mind-blowingly magnetic, that the logic of it is sort of irrelevant. That being said, I think Cabaret masks this disconnect much better than Breakfast at Tiffany's does. But it seems like the people who love Breakfast at Tiffany's, or more specifically love Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's, might react the same way to this criticism. Even if one were to acknowledge the alleged error, who cares? So what? When Audrey Hepburn stares into the window at Tiffany's, she captures their imagination and makes things feel magical. They look at her the way that she looks in that window. And isn't that kind of escapism worth something too? If the changes to the original novella impacted the reception of the film, that was not reflected in its critical or box office reception. Many critics specifically addressed the changes, but for all those who resented them, there were just as many who'd defend them. One paper said, readers of Truman Capote's wry novel may have a little trouble recognizing his celebrated heroine, Holly Golightly, when they meet her in this film version of Breakfast at Tiffany's, but that certainly doesn't mean they won't like her. The critic for the San Francisco Examiner wrote, Many lamented the changes in its transition to George Axelrod's screenplay in the same way that fundamental churchmen complain about the new translations of the Bible. But the worst adjective they could come up with was slick. When asked about the changes to the book, the producers and Blake Edwards were very clear about why they made their choices and what purpose they served. Edwards bluntly told the New York Times, call it commercialism. I believe commercialism is a very important factor in making movies. In another interview, he clarified, Axelrod followed the novel, but he added a plot, a love story, for commercial reasons. I don't mean for money, but for audience approval. Their instincts regarding broad appeal were pretty much right on the money. Breakfast at Tiffany's was enormously successful commercially, grossing $14 million, making it one of the top 10 films of the year. The film was nominated for five Academy Awards, including Best Actress for Audrey Hepburn, who eventually lost to Sophia Loren in Two Women. Capote, on the other hand, vocally disparaged the movie in years to come. Around the time of the film's release, the New York Times reported that Richard Shepard and Martin Giro had a letter from Capote in their office. It said, The screenplay of Breakfast at Tiffany's seems to me excellent, but more as a creation of its own than an adaptation of my book. No complaints, however. And anyhow, Holly is still Holly, except once or twice. Generally speaking, I think this quote from Wasson's book sums up the adaptation of Breakfast at Tiffany's really well. We see they've formed a conspiratorial bond crucial to the translation of Breakfast at Tiffany's from one kind of story to another, a character study to romantic comedy, homosexual to heterosexual, platonic to erotic. I understand why people love this movie, and even if there are parts that are genuinely unwatchable, I still like it myself. But I also understand why the adaptation is so frustrating. When something is purposely crafted to appeal to the biggest number of people, it often comes at the price of losing its grit and edge. 
I mean, you don't get thousands of people taking this picture for Instagram if Holly stayed Capote's Holly. And there's always something a little regrettable about that. I wonder whether the real book could have ever made it to the screen if the studio had pushed for it. Probably not in 1960, but I do think it would be an interesting work to adapt faithfully in 2021. Maybe we could finally let Holly be Holly. Let me know in the comments who you'd cast, then and now. Thank you again to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe, all handpicked by Mubi's curators. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. I cannot overemphasize how well curated Mubi is and how vital it is for anyone who loves cinema to give it a try. I assume since you watched this video, you probably have an interest in novel to film adaptations. Well, did you know that Mubi has a whole playlist dedicated to just that? There's Martin Eden, all of the Swedish Girl with the Dragon Tattoo films, Transit, which is one of my personal favorites, and even Melina, an Isabel Huppert film that I could not find anywhere until Mubi made it available to stream. There's genuinely so much to discover on this platform, so do yourself a favor and click the link in the description below. You'll be supporting this channel, and even better, you'll get a whole month free at movie.com slash bekindrewind. That's movie.com slash bekindrewind.